Please note that though this is a spoiler-free review of the subject, I do spoil the series and or franchise leading up to this particular entry. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I try to jam-pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. The Matrix Reloaded, Mood Review. The machines are digging. Boring. Especially for the first 40 minutes. Then it's better, I, I guess. They're digging from the surface straight down to Zion. This will enable them to avoid the defense of Zion, the, the main defense. And some ask why why haven't they done it before now? And that is explained in this. It will take them 72 hours to get there. Neo and Morpheus know that the Oracle will help ensure that they manage to stop them, but she has disappeared. Where in the first, the, the, yeah, the, the conflict is now about Zion, where in the first, it, you know, it was basically about the vast majority of humanity who were still plugged in, who were still slaves, and we expected that that would, that that was where it would continue to be. For, for one thing, like I said, it's the vast majority of humanity, and for another, it's very difficult for us to put ourselves in the places of, to, to yeah, to, to imagine ourselves as living in Zion. Not that the movie doesn't do a lot to show what that's like, but yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. And yeah, the first movie really did set it up as, you know, this, this is your life, this is your life in the Matrix, and yeah, you know, if if the if the first movie had had much more, uh, you know, about the real world and maybe even show the Zion, it would be different. But this this franchise set itself up as most of the world needs to be freed from the machines, and. Neo is also having these very lifelike nightmares about Trinity dying, which means part of the core conflict here is the white male hero worrying about losing his female romantic partner, which is about as stock a Hollywood action cliche as it gets, which is really sad for a franchise that once again started out really defining itself by going against convention and the there's there are a few times in this where we it it would appear that you know with with these nightmares it would appear that neo can see things that that may yet happen, that haven't happened yet, or that just, yeah, you know. And there are a few times in this where we, the audience, see a scene happen. And then it cuts to Neo, and it looks like he just... He just saw something, and we're left thinking, does that mean that what I just saw was a vision by Neo? Did it not actually happen? How much of it did he see? Because then later on in the film, we're going to see something that says, no, 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 that did happen. And it's not so much that it's like, it's, 
it's not really confirming that it happened as much as just assuming that you were already sure it had happened. And then it seems like Neo wasn't aware that it had happened from, from his reaction to the situation. And it's just so confusing and there's no good reason for this. The, it's, it wouldn't have been difficult for them to show us these scenes and then show us Neo seeing something. You know, just, yeah, it's, it's really, it's a very strange thing to do in a movie that already you're, you're having to really work to keep up. The first movie really did wrap up the conflict that it set up rather well. At the end of the film, we felt like, we, you know, we knew for sure that Neo was the one. And we felt like, yeah, we're, you know, we're going to win. We've been told the whole movie, once Morpheus, you know, we're, we're told that Morpheus is going to find the one. The Oracle told him so. We're told that the one will save everyone. We're told that Trinity is in love with the one and in love with Neo. And we, you know, we, we had so many confirmations that Neo is the one. So at the end of the film, it even, the, the phone call that he makes at the very end pretty much says, we've won. You know, we, the, the human race won over the machines. And because of that, to continue it on, and I, I am aware that they were, it was always planned to be a trilogy, but they did a really bad job of ending the first one in a satisfying way that left room for more conflict. In the first, in my review of the first movie, I, you know, I, I pointed out that you, you, you could watch just the first one and ignore the rest of the trilogy, similar to the original Star Wars trilogy. And to go back to that comparison, at the end of the first, at the end of A New Hope, there's still room for, it, it was a substantial victory for the rebel forces, but there's still room for, you know, there is still a war to be fought. And the next two movies, the, the rest of the trilogy, follow that up really nicely and give us a, you know, but here, it just, it seems like, well, what are, we won. That was, that was, that's what we've been told the whole movie. That means they win. And, yeah. Which means they had to come up with a new conflict. And you can really tell. Like I said, it's now about, it's now about Zion and about its physical security which was never called into question in the first movie. And do not expect this movie to remind you about anything in the first movie. If you, if you watch this, which when it came out, you know, the, those of us who really cared, we had rewatched the first one and we already remembered quite a bit of the first one. But, you know, if you're, if you're just a casual viewer, which, you know, it's not like the movie when the way it was advertised, it appeared like it would be fun for everyone. You know, it it didn't it didn't feel like a movie that is purely for the people who already really care about the subject matter. And yeah, if you know, if you were a casual viewer, you might have a real hard time keeping up. And as as everyone has noted, Zion is a disappointment. The there, yeah, there are just so many elements of it that that really disappoint. But I will say, I it it does deserve credit that you know this this vast city. We're told that two hundred and fifty thousand people live there. That takes a ton of, like, like, 
it, it really shows that even when we have almost nothing, humanity can survive and to an extent even thrive. You know, that's not, yeah, that's, that's a pretty substantial amount of, of people and that really requires a ton of really working, working relationships and at the risk of sounding as cheesy as the movie is at times, spirit and you know to say nothing of the tremendous engineering feat that to to yeah and then i see some people say ah, they look so dirty wow some people have no ability to put themselves beyond their own station in life the first movie so some have known that one of the things that were most compelling about the first movie is the fact that the majority of the human race are slaves and this movie barely touches upon that aspect at all a lot of people have drawn comparisons between this and the phantom menace and it's sadly very true huge disappointment talky one really major character that everybody hates and just yeah, this was hyped hugely, which does not mean that every positive review was purely hype, nor that every negative review was purely disappointment. And that is true of the Star Wars prequel trilogy as well, although that one is rather terrible, as these two sequels are as well. It's one thing about these two sequels, it is clear that the Wachowskis did care. This was not a cash-in. They crafted some amazing action, and they really worked on developing these philosophical ideas. They clearly believed in what they were working on. It's just that it was it was not sufficiently developed. The the you know, it's the kind of thing where you have to go through a lot of drafts. You have to work on something for a long time and be willing to kill your darlings in order to make it really work. And that didn't... It might have happened on some elements of this, but it didn't happen on enough. And, yeah, the... the convoluted mythology really takes over here as others have pointed out as was the case in the Star Wars prequel trilogy and the the human element is really lost and really the mythology was never what was the most interesting aspect of the Matrix in the first place, as others have noted. The movie takes itself entirely too seriously and really ends up very pretentious. And it's, as others have noted, really, it's more concerned with these, the, the minutia of yeah, it's it's its own, you know, all the intricacies of how it all works, how it all goes together. More interested in that than crafting a story that we can really get into. And part of it is, of course, also how do you follow what you think is reality is a simulation. That's, that's incredibly difficult to, you know, follow up. And though the movie does say that what we thought to be true isn't, but you, you can't really do that a second time. It's not... <sighs> You know, it it's not it's it doesn't do it in the same way, and it's not like the same. Yeah, 
you know, it, they, they're not just... Yeah, it's, it, it is a different twist, although still about, you know, what you believe to be... What you think is a certain way is, is not that way. But, yeah, that just... You, you can't do that a second time. You can't use that again. And at the same time, if they hadn't done something like that, then, then what do you do? It's, it's one of those things... I'm going to be going into the X-Men trilogy, which are the films I own. The, the, but yeah, the first three of the X-Men movies I'm going to be re-reviewing soon. And, you know, as, as much as there was also pressure and expectations that would, you know, nowhere near as much, but at the end of the day, they didn't have to go beyond, they didn't have to top, you know, revealing that, you know, the world is a simulation. And this does go, this does surprise us in some ways. It does, it, it, it goes where we don't really want it to. And subverting expectations can be an incredibly useful thing, incredibly effective thing in fiction. But you have to, you know, subverting expectation isn't good automatically. You know, you have to make it a good twist as well. Neo is, you know, Neo knew, knows that he's the one, but he's not as sure of himself as he appeared at the end of the first movie and you know some something that helps to humanize him is he's not really comfortable with being worshipped and I'm going to be referring to the on, on the DVD in the Ultimate Matrix set the for all three movies, there are two commentary tracks, one by the philosophers who really love the movie. I, I forget what the name of one, but the other is Cornell West. And yeah, and the other is of film critics who really didn't like the, the movies. And I'm going to be pointing to a number of the, you know, restating basically the the points that the critics point out on their commentary track and yeah really early on we're in Zion and the movie kind of it it becomes comfortable there it's it's not off base the way you know in the in the first movie for so much of it you don't know what's really going on and you're not quite sure the the movie keeps surprising you it keeps you know every so often it throws in a new rule that doesn't contradict what was set up before but you know it's now oh no now they're in a different situation what what now and yeah in this movie a direct sequel to a movie that worked so hard to always keep us, you know, we were always in uncharted territory in one way or another. Throughout the whole film, it keeps throwing in different things that, that do all go together, you know, and yeah, and in this one, from so early on, we're just, we're home. The, the you know, the characters even say, you know, the you know when when the Nebuchadnezzar arrives, they're you know the, they're greeted welcome home, and that's that's what the movie, we're we're just home. The there's there's nothing, and and you know things happen and we're introduced to characters. There's there's a lot there. It's not like nothing happens, but as a sequel to something that always kept us you know, at least a little uncertain. It, it, yeah, it, it's, 
a huge shift and again really not what we wanted and some have noted that this really lacks the heart and soul of the first one and again I wouldn't for sure it's it's not that they didn't care they clearly cared but it is it is true that it doesn't you know the 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 best intentions it, yeah they they didn't craft something that really did have a heart and soul to it even though they did put a lot of effort into it and that's it's it's too bad and i don't i don't hate the wachowskis and i you know but And this is, I suppose, where I should say, with that, I haven't watched anything they've done past Speed Racer either. But you know, I've, I've watched the the ones that they, you know, that they directed through the the, you know, the the first DP of of this, not DP, first first unit director of this, the the you know. Well, we for that it came before Speed Racer, but the the Ninja Assassin one, you know. But yeah, I I don't even know. I wouldn't know where to begin with with the what was it called again? The the huge one that they did. I, I want to say with Tom Tyker. The yeah, that that just. The Matrix signed me up, but but going that far in into you know deep meaning and yeah, I would just yeah. There's there's only so much that I can. I especially wouldn't watch in the theater. But anyway, and I have not. Well, I I did consider. I considered watching Jupiter Ascending, but then people watched it and said what they thought of it and then I decided not to but yeah the I don't really blame the Wachowskis clearly they tried but they just the film wasn't sufficiently developed and as others have noted it uh, it really doesn't feel like the first movie and here the the shifts between the real world and the matrix Although less they they they're less sudden, I suppose you could say. And there maybe aren't I'm not sure there are as many of I don't know. But they they you know they especially you know feel jarring and Neo although he he doesn't wear the trench coat that he did at the end of one he does dress as assuredly as he did at the end of one that is something that I, I didn't talk about that in the the news for the first one but you know rewatching it again they they did a really great job of like I mean you know he's he's wearing what we'd maybe like to wear as well earlier in the film but you can really tell that once he really dives in once he's like no we're you know we're gonna rescue Morpheus this is yeah he you know what he wears then is much closer to what the others wear he has he is as self-assured as they are he yeah and yeah he continues to dress that way in this and the the critics point out especially when he's airborne he really looks like a priest and that really works i feel it he he really has accepted that he is the one and we see a lot more of the the world inside the matrix in this where you know in, in the first one you don't really see that many places you know we, we mostly see these abandoned you know 
areas that are safer for the, the rebels and you know we go to the the oracles but other than that we we don't get to see a lot of the world inside the matrix because it isn't really about that you know you might say and yeah in this you really do and we get to see Trinity actually use that motorcycle of hers and not only for driving either and in the opening of this we get the the camera really caresses her you know tar black PVC suit and it's yeah it's it's exquisite this movie does not have an ending it has a pause at the end and then we had to wait six months to see the rest it's it is half a movie this is very decidedly half of a movie and I know that some were very satisfied with with you know Kill Bill being split into two but by the end of Kill Bill a lot has happened and you know I mean even if you if you ignore the fact that the, the sheer length of you know the, there there's no way they're ever gonna show all of Kill Bill you know both volumes in in just yeah of, of course they're gonna split them up but the ending also really both have a sort of you know a, a twist at the end that kind of yeah where where you know we're sure we'll be back to see the rest but yeah in in this not that much has really happened that has really hugely changed things and we didn't know we knew that there were two movies but we did not know that they literally that that this one just stops and then the the rest have you know they they've done stuff like this in other like I'm not entirely sure I know of a series of movies where like we to we really did not know that two movies would be you know that that where that that the two movies comprise the whole and at the end of part one it was just gonna see okay now you know watch part two I yeah I don't I don't know of another where just to this extent and I mean the you know both both Middle Earth trilogies you know, yeah, when where one movie ends, the next movie starts. Basically, you know, the I already mentioned Kill Bill. I suppose some of these could be spoilery, but yeah, there are, there are other movies that do this, and this is the only one where I really felt like it just, yeah, it's it's such a huge disappointment. We we all groaned in unison when. The, the you know just suddenly the the movie just stops it's uh, yeah I really hate when people say that you know people who don't like this movie don't get it first off that's an uphill battle the, this movie has no excuse to be this difficult to follow and second off a lot of us did and we were still disappointed and and even even ignoring the disappointment I've watched the movie many times since having you know having accepted that it did not live up to the hype and just saying you know what I'm just it's a movie I'm gonna watch it as a movie and just it's it's the second movie it's it's a movie that follows the matrix and just you know just just view it as that and 
if, even if you just even even if you try not to think too much about the first one while watching it yeah it just it it's constantly with with all the the philosophy and such it is doing all these Yeah, it's 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 difficult to follow, especially the first time. And people who you know, the the I suppose yeah, that covers what I wanted to say about that. Now you really don't need to like like some people say, ah, oh, it's not you know, you 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 can't just watch the the three movies. You have to also watch the Animatrix. You have to play Enter the Matrix, you know. And then there are the comics and such. I, the comics are great. Enter the Matrix. It's the Animatrix is amazing. Some of the comics are amazing as well. But you know, and Enter the Matrix. I have a soft spot for it. It's honestly, I think I was way less let down by Enter the Matrix than The Matrix Reloaded, and and certainly Revolutions. Part of it is also that, you know, as long as you go into that game knowing that it's a licensed game that was rushed out during, like it's fine that they spent, you know, they they spent these several years after 90, you know, between, excuse me, between 99 and 2003, excuse me, making all of these, you know, but it clearly wasn't long enough for them to make the video game, excuse me, fully, yeah, you know, you, you can tell where they took shortcuts and there's overall too little content and, but, but, Never. I love when I watch the, you know, on the DVDs, there are these, you know, kind of making of where they talk about, oh, you know, when you play the game, there are two completely different storylines. Yeah, there are a few times where the two storylines are different, but not that many. When you play the whole game as both characters, you will be surprised at just how little difference there actually is. And then they tell, oh, you know, you can tell you can like download how how to like train with a sword. Yes, that's true. You can download how to train with one sword. That's it. That's the only extra weapon or anything like that there is. And when you actually play it, it's it's cool, and I, I, you know, in part, I do, I, I like some of the choices they made surrounding that, but, yeah, I, I guess it's, it's not really a spoiler to say. Basically, if you use the sword, that's what you do instead of disarming and doing counter, I, I believe also doing counter attack. It's been a while since I played with the sword, but I do play the game every so often. And, yeah, I mean, you're not forced to use the sword, so you can still, you, you can choose to play it with that, but, you know, if you wanted to play both with the sword and be able to actually disarm and, yeah, that's, that is disappointing then, but, yeah, the, and Enter the Matrix does have the single funniest character in the entire franchise and that is of course the operator sparks who is just hilarious every every step of the way yeah and I really wish he was in the, the these two movies more but anyway but no you do not have to actually yeah the the basically there are parts of the Animatrix that, in this movie, you're you're told that the the hovercraft, the Osiris, discovered the machines digging, and was and and they're the reason why 
you know, the rebels are aware. In the Animatrix, you see the Osiris, see it, and then do a drop-off in the Matrix. In Enter the Matrix, you pick up, you, you pick up that drop. That's it. The, you, you just don't see those parts. But you can, you, you don't need to see those parts. And another Animatrix short explains the character here of the kid. You know, you, you see him actually leave the the matrix, hence him him being in Zion here. But again, that's that's it. They they say it in the movie. They they say, Oh, but you know, you found him, you saved him. No, he he found me and he saved himself. That's it. That's all there is that like you might hate the character less if you watch the Animatrix before you watch the movie, although I doubt it. But yeah, it's just it's that's that's you you don't need to. You can just watch. You can stick to just the trilogy and pretend none of the additional material matter and it, that they even exist, and and you'll be fine. And yeah, the. When this came out, they did try to sell us a million products related to it. You know, the the yeah, the the various things that they advertised with yeah. But that's actually that is something that there there are portions of this where you maybe kind of expect there to be an action scene, and then there isn't, and that's because. It's in the game, plain and simple. You when, when you when you play the game, you get to do the action that you would expect to see in the movie there, and you know that that makes this movie that has a lot of action at times feel like yeah, like action scenes were cut out, and then at the same time there weren't actually enough. You know, it's it's a short game as well, but yeah, there, there weren't actually enough of these separate, you know, the, 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 one of the best, one, one of the best parts of the game is the very start, where you go to pick up the drop that, you know, I'm, I'm not talking just, oh, level design, so, you know, there, there are later levels that get more, you know, later enemies. What I mean is just that portion of the game where you just go to pick up the drop so that, you know, it, it ties together the, the animatrix short and then this movie. But, you know, like I said, you, you can watch this movie and not, you know, not worry about who picked up the drop and how did that happen, you know. But when you play the game, that mission makes you feel like, oh, okay, so what I just did matters. Because if I hadn't picked up the drop, then we wouldn't know about the, the machines. But then, you know, some of the later missions in the game are the action scenes that are then missing from the movie. And... In both cases, whether you're playing the game or watching the movie, you can tell that something's missing. And it's it just it's kind of awkward. And I mean, I don't know that they could really have done much to do it differently, but at the end of the day, it probably just probably just goes to show that licensed games are not you know, I'm I'm speaking specifically of like movie tie-ins and that kind of thing. When you're when you're doing something look again, there are there are just a few, I know two, licensed video games that aren't that that are actually good, that are even great. And that's the original Aladdin game and the TMNT game that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into the movie. I would say the game is significantly better than the movie, but, yeah. And it's, again, like, you know, with both of those, if you don't watch the movie at all, it's going to be somewhat confusing to you, because the whole story simply isn't there. But, yeah, at the end of the day, the the... 
it's fine to do a game based on an overall like idea and franchise, but to just straight up do it as a tie-in that rarely goes well. But yeah, you know, like I said, the, there there are there are other parts of Enter the Matrix where it actually where you're playing something that you don't you know that you don't really know about in that you either just don't see or whatever in, in the, the movie and there's especially there's one specific part where if you just watch the movie and you have no idea yeah you know you don't know how a certain situation came to be but in the game you know if you yeah if if you do both close to, you know or you just or you know that that happened in the game then it helps explain that part but again ultimately it doesn't really need to be there but then you have these parts where in Enter the Matrix you're playing as Ghost or Niobe and Ghost and Niobe both experience things very similar to what Neo Trinity and Morpheus experienced in the movie they just experienced it maybe a little earlier so yeah, it and and it's just it's such complete because you if you played the game and you like let, yeah, let's say you were replaying the game so you, you used the previous load and then when you got to that part you just decided to skip ahead to where it yeah, you wouldn't miss anything. The these parts of the game change nothing and it's it's just I can I guess I can kind of understand how and why because you they expect that you'd want to kind of be but it just yeah it's it's really really bad of an of an idea to to do it like that but yeah and and that really that is it boils down to most of the game being cut action scenes from the movie and these scenes that don't really need to be like they they're actually yeah they're a lot like the action scenes in this movie they they don't necessarily really change that much it's just kind of okay well the good guys are here and then some of the bad guys come in and then they have to fight because the good guys have to get away from the bad guys and that's it there's there's no actual nothing actually changes and <clears throat> the a lot of the lines here they kind of feel like like set up setups for jokes by Rodney Dangerfield rest in peace you know like a character will say i believe something and then it's like you know what do you believe you know literally another character says what do you believe i believe that and it's just if you if you went in and this is what I'm talking about development just go in and just remove those extraneous words just have you know like yeah early on a character says I believe that the that this is the only way we can stop the army and if he just said I believe this is the only way we can stop the army but instead he says I believe something what do you believe I believe that this is the only way and it's so unnecessary and they do this over and over and it's you know you can change they, they change the extraneous words sometimes and it's but but as it it boils down to a lot of times where characters will just say I know this how do you know it I just know it or just yeah you know where where it's just they're not you're not adding something by adding these words, except the words themselves. When this first came out, me and a friend of mine were just obsessed with the Matrix. And, you know, in the first one, yeah, you know, Neo ends up being able to fly. And so we were like, oh, could, could he possibly still, you know, the, yeah, could could he still fly? And then they released that teaser. There's not a spoiler where 
he does this like he does this flip jump. He he jumps backwards and upwards and yeah, and and it's like okay, he can still fly. Otherwise, he would not be able to do that. And Neo is not the only major non-agent character who has powers, and Neo does use his a lot. And there's there's an ironic aspect of of this. At the same time, Keanu Reeves is pushed past what you know he some of the acting he does in this it just yeah it goes beyond what he can do convincingly at the same time he doesn't really show as much emotion as he did in the first one and trinity doesn't either and it's given how excuse me given how much time they spend in the real world in this one you would really think so. You would really expect that, you know, that's where they can be themselves. That's that's where they don't, yeah. And Smith is back, which I'm really not sure they planned for when they killed him at the end of the first movie. I, again, I know they always planned three, and maybe they did, but just the the way they did it it just yeah i i i feel like let's say if they had already planned to bring him back they should have done it in a different way in the first one because in the first one it looks extremely final and the the loves story between Neo and Trinity is still not compelling and now we're supposed to care now it's supposed to be a really big deal and it's just you, you do not know why these two are together it's not that Trinity loves him because he is the one no she knew that it's it's the other way around she fell in love with him and thus knew that he would be that he had to be the one because she was told that she would fall in love and the man she loved would be the one. So why, what, what about him did she fall in love with? It's, it's the, the unexplained Hollywood movie kind of love. And I mean, if, if that's all you're going to do, I'm not asking that every single movie have a really, like, have, have a lot of, of detail to the love to the romance where you can really sink your teeth in and okay that's how but if you're gonna make it that big of a deal then we need to understand it and it's just not like the 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 critics joke ah it's all those you know all those important conversations that they've had together because they haven't had any they they and and like I say in the in the thoughts on on the third on the first one there's there are plenty of, there, there are compelling relationships in the first movie but they're not between the two of them and it could be you they in the first part of this movie we spend a lot of time in Zion and the two of them spend you know yeah they they spend a lot of time together and at no point wh what we see is that he has he's worried that she'll be hurt because of these lifelike dreams but that's it if if he wasn't having the lifelike dreams there wouldn't be anything you know there there literally would be nothing there in the scenes that they have together the 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 one thing is that he wants to keep her alive and he's afraid he might not be able to that's that's all there is and yeah, it's just, it, it really, and it's not the only love kind of, we're introduced to a new character in this. The, the, he's, he's in charge of the defense of Zion. His name escapes me at the moment, I'm pretty sure it's Locke, Commander Locke. 
he hates Morpheus and he doesn't believe in the prophecy of the one and that you know I mean you can you can understand Morpheus is you know is this zealot and he doesn't really yeah I mean the the one thing that he cares about is the one and the prophecy and so he yeah like early on he asks another ship to stay you know to stay behind as he you know he he returns to Zion because he has to recharge that's the only re he he you know that's is a dryly stated it's one of the the times where the movie actually does have some humor to it and and where the the dry stating of this quip actually works but yeah you know like Locke says you asked another ship to stay in the matrix so that the the oracle could, could contact them and Morpheus is like I would have stayed but we had to recharge the ship you know so yeah and and Locke is like I gave a direct order and the machines are on their way I need I need to know that the the ships are gonna do as I as I, I'm in charge of the defense and I formulated a plan that requires the ships to, so you you can understand why this guy is frustrated with, although because we love Morpheus we kind of end up hating Locke but then in the middle they have to throw in that Niobe Jada Pinkett Smith used to be with Morpheus and now she's with Locke so it's a love triangle the the future of Zion in part rests upon a love triangle it's it's not just these philosophical differences it's not just that these two people have completely different ideas of how best to protect their beloved city no no there's gotta be you know yeah and it's so I mean love triangles in general don't do them if you don't really have something incredibly compelling to do there just just don't they're they're not in and of a, a love triangle should not exist unless it had some other purpose than there being a love triangle it's such an easy cheap way to add drama the you know oh will she be with him will she be with him yeah, and I don't think there were quite as many of them back when these came out, but it was still just, it's so pointless. There's, you could completely remove the love triangle, and it would, yeah, it would just improve the, the yeah. And tank died in between movies because the actor wanted more money he probably in universe he probably hammed himself to a heart attack in between movies he you know dozer died as tank lived hamming it up and he's replaced with michael dawson okay as, as many others have noted he's a completely pointless character but why did they only replace Tank? Why the, the, the character of the kid even points this out? Like, Morpheus has only filled your position. I'm sure he has his reasons. That's it. We never, we're never told why he didn't. In the first movie, ten people ran the Nebuchadnezzar. Now four is enough? when the the you know and, and in the first one there weren't guns requiring people to man them on the ships you know it the the I I'm not 100 percent certain if there are guns on the Nebuchadnezzar but if there aren't why not the the other ships sure have them and yeah, you know, and and in in the first 
in the first movie, there were two people who, who never plugged in, Tank and Dozer. So at least there'd be two when everybody else was plugged in. Now there's there's just the one person, you know. The, to, to be fair, in, in Enter the Matrix, there's only three crew members in, in total, but yeah, and especially baffling is that these are, these appear to be the only two ships that have anywhere near this few people on them. The other ships, as far as we see, have more people, even, even the ones we barely see at all have more people on them and part of it is of course that in the first movie the entire supporting cast pretty much is on board the Nebuchadnezzar the the if if hypothetical if the first movie only had one crew member other than the Trinity then there'd be almost no characters in the film but that's part of it. Now that this has this, now that this introduces Zion with all these, you know, with all these thousands of people, there are. It, if if the if the Nebuchadnezzar had ten people on it, if we met seven new people, yeah, that'd be a lot. That'd be too much. And in Enter the Matrix, also there's. You know, because at any given time, the idea in End of the Matrix is the two of them are. It's not always that both of them are plugged in, but it often is the case. And, you know, certainly the idea is that either of them could be plugged in, since you can play as either of them. And yeah, if there were other characters, they'd get in the way, kind of. And. Given that it's it's again it's a big problem, you know when when you have the first movie and you have all these crew members who all have at least a little bit of definition of character, and then in this suddenly there's almost no one on the ship, and there are way more characters in general, and a lot of them don't really have that much more to them, you know the. With introducing Zion and with introducing all these new additional characters, it's far too much for the movie to, to handle. And it really it, it gets bogged down in introducing all of this and especially in being so heavy about it. And so like a lot of the movies in the MCU also introduce a lot or expect you to have watched a lot of movies before it but they they keep to much swifter pace you know pretty much all of them do and they there really isn't Iron Man 2 comes close but there really isn't a an MCU movie that by itself has to introduce a huge amount of different things and that you know where it becomes completely unwieldy and that is the case here we're really not given much reason to care about all these characters excuse me a lot of them are completely unnecessary in the first movie everyone at one point or another basically every, everyone that you would expect to you don't expect the oracle to of course or the 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 kids in the, no but everybody else the everyone on the Nebuchadnezzar crew all three agents every you know cop or SWAT guy that you see is involved in an action scene. They don't all get to kick ass, but they're all involved. <laughs> Cypher especially doesn't. He just he sneezes, revealing their position, and then he trips and has to be abandoned. But to be fair, the the tripping was very much that was what he needed to do. But he's still involved in an action scene. There's some idea that oh something might happen here, and that's just not the case with so many of these. They they introduce. Maybe I don't know. I'll, 
I think over half a dozen ships, again, with their own crews, with their own captains, you know, at one captain each. And we actually meet all these characters at least once, the, the very early on. There's the, the, the characters actually meet in one location, and then almost immediately it's revealed why that's a terrible idea. To be fair, as far as I understand, it was the, the fastest way to get all of these. It was, it was faster for them all to meet in this one location than if they all tried to travel back to Zion you know, and actually what they find out is also, yeah, and, and some of what they, you know, that that's where they talk about the machines are digging. So that, that piece of information needed to be conveyed to all of them as quickly as possible. And, as you know, when they get back to Zion, there's, you know, some some talk about how much do we tell the people of Zion so you know if all the captains went into a meeting room and then came out and nobody said what it was about yeah that might get a little you know so so it makes sense to have the meeting there but nevertheless we have all these characters in the same place and so we we quote unquote meet all these people but there's not really anything we, yeah, they're, they're not involved in action scenes except in the game. In the game, right after the captains meet, when, you know, when they then get attacked. In the game, you know, whether you play as Niobe or Ghost, you then spend some levels running around, you know, trying to get yourself out safely. But then also, you know, you, you, you'll meet some of the other you know, crew members and captains and such, and you'll have to protect, you know, escort mission kind of, yeah. So they're, they're, you know, they are involved in an action scene, and then, but when you just watch the movie, and you see all these people, all these, you know, cruel looking people in one place, and then nothing actually happens, there's no action scene that they all get involved in, there's, yeah, it just, it, it feels... They, yeah, for, for one thing, they feel less necessary, and they just also, we feel less connected to them, because they're not, not much is really happening with them, and some of these characters, you barely see at all. Some of them are in the background in the captain's meeting, and that's more or less it. And, yeah, it's just, again, it, they probably should have, if they had dropped all plans of the game, then it probably wouldn't have been that difficult to just rewrite it so that all of them had just been told. We didn't need a scene where all of them were standing there because they don't really do anything. A few of them have lines. Some of the, some of the ones who have lines we really wish had, didn't have lines, but yeah, they're, they're just there. And, you know, I mean, it's fine for the the movie to tell me there are like eight ships and you know it's important that there are eight ships okay that's fine i don't need to meet the crew of them to to understand that there are eight you know the yeah there there are plenty of things where it's just you know i mean i you don't see like a ton of different people who all like I don't know work to to make the the food in Zion or something. You know you don't need to see that. We can we can surmise that they exist and they do their job. That's all. And meeting all these characters, you just you you're like okay, so they're going to be important, and then they disappear. And, and to, to an extent, the same is true. In the game, they more or less, they're there so that you can protect them. And the... Part of it is also, we can only tolerate so many stoic badass... You know, these characters are not that different. They're all just... Yeah, they... they 
they're all just these stoic badasses and they talk very little or way too much and they're also just they're too similar that a lot of them feel like variations on a few types and the first one just did them better you know the we we have the determined you know female soldier who can sometimes be feminine you know Niobe is basically just she's a lot like Trinity and yeah just in general you know the 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 first movie really captures these yeah they just they use these different types much much better there's there's no character in this that stands out to me the way the kid did the the way that mouse did in the first considering the amount of lines and screen time and just you know how much they actually impact the plot and such like you could basically remove mouse from the first movie if you really like if you were like we you know we gotta cut at least one of these characters we have to cut all of his scenes but you lose a lot you know he has a lot of just funny little moments you know the the he's he's this kind of shy and awkward but then when he does you know and and he's sitting there talking about you know maybe that's why chicken tastes like everything you know and and then suddenly he's talking about like sexual fantasy and to to this guy he barely knows you know and then later we see him like staring at like a fold out of of like of the woman in the red dress you know and the just is that fold out? whatever i think you you know what i mean you know there's there's so much to this and and when he dies i care you know and just yeah in this there's no character who's anywhere near that kind of yeah and yeah i've already mentioned you know a few of these new characters we just really hate some of them are irritating some of them hate people that we care about or to mention Locke the kid he is basically the Jar Jar Binks of this, except he has less screen time, and he's not a racist. Stereotype. You know, he's he's not offensive in that way. Only in every single other way that his character could possibly be offensive, he is intolerable, and just yeah. There's and I've kind of already hinted this. Some of the acting in this again is just terrible. And it feels like it just some of these characters they have so few lines and such a limited amount of screen time that is couldn't you just have cast a better actor there? Like in 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 the first one, you know, there are some actors, some characters who are in a ton of scenes and you know just and then occasionally they'll have a line and they're like oh wow that was not well delivered and it's like they filmed the rest of those scenes and then they gave them a line and it's oh that's bad you know and they couldn't necessarily go back and reshoot all that okay fine but with these characters where they just they're in the film so little and then they have just a few lines like either decide on the lines and then cast better actors since they're going to be in so little of it anyway you know again part of it is well they also had to be in the game so they had to have their like moves cause you know they're not even that much in the game either and it's not like it was vital that we saw the faces of the anyway yeah the the You know, either decide, okay, so these these characters are going to have lines, so I need to make sure they have good actors cast for them, or just cast them however you want, and then try to just, I don't give those lines to other characters or something. As much as we all hate 
the Hemi Merovingian, the Perv Merv. He is, as the critics point out, the only character having fun. And I do love the twins. They're basically, they're these... Yeah, it's the, the movie introduces that some programs in human form, when they, you know, they're, they're going to be deleted for some, you know, maybe they, maybe they, they glitch, or maybe they're just, you know, maybe they're replaced by a better, newer, better program. They, you know, they're supposed to be deleted, but some choose exile instead, and the Merovingian has a bunch of exiles working for him, and yeah, the the twins have this ability to like I want to say ghost, but the problem is there's also a character named Ghost. The yeah, Niobe's yeah on the logos ship in the Enter the Matrix, but yeah, they can kind of they they turn transparent. And that allows them to heal injuries and not take damage in that form. And to also just move through, like a ghost, move through solid objects and such. And they, you know, to, to for, the, for the look of that, the, the designers used, like, the way that... Yeah, jellyfish, basically, and yeah, it's a really memorable visual of them, yeah. And there are these really sadistic, like, there's one part where, there, yeah, there, there are a few times where they have the very, like, basically, they can, they can put a little bit of effort into making sure that they don't harm, even kill innocent people, or they can just go through the innocent people. You know, that's that's the decision that they have. Not only do they choose to harm or even kill innocent people, they're smiling as they do. They're they're doing it. You know, they they're really sadistic, and one of them at least chooses. A, an old-fashioned straight razor to to yeah to attack and it's like you know they okay so they have an extremely sharp weapon you know you could but the fact that it's a straight razor suggests that they may have been doing this for decades they they picked this straight razor you know a while back and they've just been used because nobody uses a straight razor. If if somebody has a straight razor today, it's because their grandfather used one or something. It okay, that might be too. But yeah, you know, no one goes out and just buys a straight razor today. Even even if you don't use an electronic shaver, you know, you're not gonna buy one of those because you might slit an artery instead of you know what's what's the, you know too close of a shave kind of thing yeah they they chose this weapon a while back and they just yeah because it's not even that handy to use when you think about it you you know you'd figure they'd be using a regular knife or something and just make that extremely sharp no they want they they're fine that it's harder to use as long as they can just immediately just slice through you know yeah and, you know, this has Monica Bellucci and, you know, the, the, the obvious thing is that she, you know, she, the, the woman is built from sex appeal, you know, and that's obviously part of her casting and that's not like... It's it's not like they're trying to just trick in. No, the the characters decidedly meant to be hypersexual, and you know I'm not gonna say that. Oh, it's just you know no, they didn't have to put in a hypersexual character, 
but they didn't just put in an attractive actress just because they they actually made the character fit that yeah and she has this like you know she's she's kind of flirty but there's also this kind of sinister aspect to her where yeah and and it's she she does just spot on perfectly and now the going back to the Merovingian he he lives in luxury but he he pushes it just a little bit too far he you know it it becomes too much and it's like you know one one thing is that he apparently has all these statues in like yeah in in this big room but they're all of himself apparently you know they they say on on the you know the dv you know making of kind of yeah that's yeah and the 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 Merovingians were a line of French kings who believed that they were the direct descendants of Jesus. So yeah, that that and that that really fits the character rather well. The, while there are still a lot of just separate references that don't end up adding up. There are still a ton of little things that hint at certain ideas and don't, you know. And, and bring up this particular worldview or idea, but not go anywhere with it. That's still the case. But with several of these, you know, Monica Bellucci plays the character Persephone. That's also, her character name is also incredibly important. And yeah, the there are actually, I mean, part of it is also there are more, you know, and the first one is really only the oracle that's, you know, a, a major character where that that character is named for the the kind of overall, you know, the 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 hacker aliases. They're just the you know these. They might hint at things. There's a little bit to the name of Morpheus, for example. But other than that, they do just they they hint at things without really. Yeah. But in this, now that we see more of the world of the Matrix, now we meet more characters. Yeah, their their names very specifically mean something for what what they have experienced or what they're doing or or the like. And the Merovingian as a character makes a lot of sense. He's basically running a mob. He's he's a mafia head, a ma mafioso or yeah. He knows that it's a simulation. But the 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 police can't really touch him because he's got all these exiles. So yeah, he has a lot of you know, he's he's aware that where he exists is not you know is not real but he hasn't he's not leaving the matrix he's not you know and yeah he doesn't he doesn't help out the rebels or the like he he doesn't have empathy for humanity as a whole he might have for for excuse me certain ones but not humanity as a whole and yeah then what do you do you become you know you you run a mob and he's like there there's this bit where he tries to yeah he he wants to have some of his guys you know kill someone and he they're they're literally lined up like an old fashioned mafia with with the tommy guns and they're just gunning down you know so so just straight up and yeah and you know like i said the 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 cops don't have the power to you know 
they're probably not, you know, like, if cops try to, to stop, you know, he'll just, yeah, he's, he's not going to have any problems with him. And the agents aren't going to touch him because he's not really doing anything that he's not helping the rebels. The rebels, they have their hands full with the rebels. So, yeah, you know, he, he exists in that nice little middle spot where he can just sit there and sip wine and eat just ridiculously luxurious food and yeah. One of Michael Dawson's like I think it's his is his sister in law I don't know, there there's some relation to Anna Espinosa, so don't trust her. And we meet some the agents in the first one proved to be insufficient since Neo blew one of them up. They have been upgraded, so we meet three new ones, and they, they're just the perfect face and the perfect type. And Johnson seems to be the, the most aggressive and appears to be the leader, and he's played by... Daniel Bern, Bernhardt, I think it's, you know, Ciro from the the greatest Mortal Kombat character. And he's just, he's spot on. Like, you know, I mean, it makes sense to cast him, you know, with the martial arts background. But then he also just, he has this smile when he's about, like, one of the first things, you know, we, we see him like, you know, he's, he's, they're, they're, the, the, there are three agents, and they're attacking. They, they bust down the door to the captain's meeting. But, you know, Neo saw through the door. Okay, there are agents, so, you know, everyone get your exits. And then, you know, they bust down the door, and then they see him standing there. And, you know, and they're like, okay, do, do we still do, you know, and the, yeah, they, they each say a few words of the, you know, kind of like, like, like the three different parts of a computer just writing out. It's like you know the yeah. There's there's a nice little or as though they're just sending very short messages to one another. But you know they they end up saying no no we're still going to try to fight him. After all, he is still only human. And those last two words are spoken by Johnson, and he smiles and he's like I'm on take down this guy, you know, and goes for it, and just, the, the, we don't see them an awful lot, the three new agents, but every time they really make an impact, and every single time we see Johnson, he's got that smile, he's, I've got you now, and it's just, it's so much fun, you know, I mean, obviously he's no Smith, but, you know, he, he couldn't possibly be, and, Given that he's not quite going to be Smith, he's a really good kind of, you know, sec you know runner-up kind of thing. And with that, you know, I, Will Smith passed on the role of Neo for the first one, and then Jada Pinkett Smith is in this one. I do have to wonder if that came up, maybe even still comes up, around the Smith household and apparently she also tried to be Trinity in the first one so yeah and and when they tried to give you know when they when they contacted her with with the role she was like nine months pregnant or something so yeah they really wanted <laughs> yeah but yeah there are, there are for sure enough Smiths in this movie And and we do find I already mentioned Locke. He he does not believe in Neo or the One, the prophecy of the One. But it does appear that the majority of Zion do. Or failing that that the ones who don't aren't vocal about it. But yeah, Cornell West is a brilliant thinker. He's not a very good actor. 
and he's given lines in this for some reason and entirely too many of them. Roy Jones Jr. has too many lines as well, but he doesn't actually have very many of them. And again, it's... And he doesn't even get to kick ass in this movie. Why would you cast him right? Because he gets to kick ass in Enter the Matrix for half a minute or so. It, it really, like, they, they, again, in that case, go with an actor. It, it's pretty clear that the Wachowskis just wanted to work with Cornell West and Roy Jones Jr. And, you know, Cornell West, like I said, he's one of the two philosophers doing the, the commentary tracks for all three movies. And he appears in the, you know, obviously they're like, you know, they talk, the, the you know, they, they talk with him in between shooting the the you know for the the during the documentaries they talk with him on set but there are also you know some of the documentaries where it's where they just go into the philosophy purely there he also is so it's not like he was you know Cornell West would have been you know on a matrix DVD even if he wasn't in the movies even if he hadn't done the commentary tracks, even. Some have noted the the personal relationships in this aren't really convincing, and that's a really big problem because the the characters kind of do they they it's a big part of what they what's going on are their personal relationships and yeah, we just don't really buy him. <sighs> the first one has some lines that are bad, but were meant to be clever. But the first one does a better job of having so many really great lines that they don't stand out as much, and just, yeah, and here, there's there's this part where a counselor talk, you know the, the they have Zion has a counsel you know that that's that's how they you know they're they're in charge that's that's their you know their government basically and one of these counselors talks to Neo and he's like talking about oh man the you know there are machines keeping us alive here, but there are other machines coming to kill us. And then Neo is like, oh, so that's your point. And then the counselor says, and I quote, no, no point. Old men like me don't make points. There is no point. I, I don't think it is, but it almost sounds like one of those things where, like, they wrote the script and then they found out that they weren't allowed to use like a certain term, a, a synonym where, you know, like instead every other of those points were supposed to be subluclusclang, you know, so that he was saying old men like me don't make subluclusclang, there's no point, that's the subluclusclang, but Sabulusaga isn't a word, at least not on this planet, so I know that's not the case, and it's just, I, I don't, it's, it's, it's like, it's like Lucas's lines, you know, I wish, I could just wish away my feelings, the, the, the bit in Revenge of the Sith about why she looks so beautiful, and it's because of love, technically, there's, there, you know, they're they're actually saying something there, but it's it's just the the lines are so poorly written, and it yeah. The Smith can now copy himself. He can he can clone himself into other people. We see this very early on. He sticks a hand in their chest and 
then the the new person yeah takes on his appearance and occasionally when he'll do this there will be like a little you know bit around it. and one of the times right after he does this then yeah after doing it he then you know like tidies up the the new clones tie and he says thank you and it's my pleasure and then and that's, that's cute enough it's not, it's not hilarious but it's, it's a cute enough bit but then there's one time where he's doing it to an agent and like you know the agent you know recognizes Smith and he's like you and then Smith says yes me sticks his hand in me 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 takes his hand out the the agents now clone Smith and the, the clone says me too that's terrible there's there's that's just that's terrible and then there's this ongoing bit where like it's 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 the love triangle where one of the characters will say to you know the, the characters will say to one, to one another some things never change but some things do that's it and they say that over and over and it's like again I, I get what they're saying but they needed to that's that's a place where they needed some more words instead of you know where, where a lot of the time it's these extraneous words that they need to cut here they needed to put in some you know just if every so often when they said it what they said was this this will never change but that has changed you know replacing this and that with what they're talking about but I'm not going to give that away but yeah and and these lines where a character will say you know I believe this and then another character will say well I believe you know I believe something too what do you believe I believe that and it's just yeah and this this has the worst line I I forget if it's in any Hollywood movie ever or if it's in a Hollywood action movie or specific I'm not gonna quote it here because it, I'd probably get at least one word wrong and you need to you need to get the exact line just to bathe in how gloriously awful of a line it is but you can look it up I I want to say it's like it's on the wiki page or maybe the IMDB trivia but one of those and just yeah read it for yourself this does cast a number of non-white and you know also some who are not like some some elderly some middle-aged and elderly characters and you know the as as you know the the movie has a lot of non-white characters and it you know some of the non-white characters some of the older characters are in positions of power and i do think that it is worth noting that yeah you know they they did actually you know they they were saying to the world to to hollywood to audiences everywhere this is what the world really looks like you know it's not just a bunch of white guys you know the the there are other ethnicities and it, and not everybody is young not everybody powerful is you know is a young white guy or an old white guy for that matter I believe it was the critics who pointed this out as well. The, the clothes look amazing on these characters. They did in the first as well, when, when they're in the Matrix. But in the first one, the characters didn't really excuse me, stand around in them. Like, if you want to see the characters just in those outfits, you have to look at like publicity photos 
or the you know DVD, you know the the cover for the the DVD, you know things like that. Because in the first, it's always like a really cool shot, and or they're actually moving. You know, maybe it's even an action scene. In this. Yeah, in the captain's meeting, just a ton of these guys just standing there wearing these. You know, a lot of them are in the background. A lot of them have no lines. And they're just standing there, and you just... Then it does get to be a little awkward looking that they're wearing this. You know, it, it looks great when they're walking, when they're doing something decisive, when it's a cool shot. But when it's just a shot of a bunch of people talking and they're just standing yeah it just it doesn't really and the a lot of a lot about this movie is that they wanted to redo things in the first one but just make them bigger some of that does work but the majority of the time it just it's it's kind of the thing of less is more and it's it more in quantity but not more in quality not not higher quality there's a ton of just you know way way too much of slow mo of fighting of action scenes and some have noted there are parts of this where it's video game music and video game action that doesn't bother me as much as it bothers some and I would definitely say that this is one where you can still enjoy watching it where you know there are a lot of times where an action scene is a video game action scene and it's really you know the the there's a lot of that in the Resident Evil movie franchise some point out why does Neo still have to fight with martial arts you know and at the end of the first one he you know Smith had been the greatest danger to him or to the other rebels this entire movie and he blew him up he jumped inside his body and blew him up why does he still need to fight with melee and you know and in part with the like I said you know the, the agents are upgrade agents he can't blow them up and yeah I mean I, I you're not wrong and it definitely it is a problem that the film it's 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 something that is it's it's the elephant in the room every time he does fight absolutely but I can't claim that I that I would have wanted him not to fight that I you know I hypothetically if he had jumped into everyone and just blown them up you know yeah that that wouldn't at all be yeah but and and that's again that's the thing what they they basically made him god he's a god of the matrix now that's what happened at the end of the first movie that's what he became and when you had a movie of, you know, people using extraordinary powers, but not quite attaining that level, yeah, what do you do to follow that up? And it's again, they they shouldn't have made him quite that powerful or made it that apparent that he was that powerful at the end of one if they were going to make more movies. And the you can now more most of the action is in one block in the middle, and not a lot happens in the rest of the movie. Especially the the first big chunk of the film is just. We're stuck in Zion, and we're just we're just waiting for the Oracle to contact. You know, like I said, the, there's the captain's meeting, but then there's not really a lot of action there because that action happens in the game. 
and then we're just waiting for the oracles and we're spending all this time in Zion meeting all these new people that we don't really care about and seeing this world that we didn't realize was really going to be that important to the the story and it really during the action scenes it helps when something actually changes rather than there just being more and yeah that's the thing a lot of it it is just there's more you know it, it a fight keeps going there's there's one part where Neo is in a big fight that just kind of keeps going and then at one point he grabs this metal pole and once he starts using that for one thing that changes how the action plays out a little bit but it's also okay that's that's a new thing there's you know he's been fighting with his bare hands and then he grabs a pole and starts finding you know that it changes things a little bit and yeah there's there's too little of that in the movie nevertheless the freeway scene is amazing has not been topped might never be topped and yeah i'm i'm not going to spoil it here but i will go into details on it in the thoughts video and they did actually build like a mile and a half of freeway in order to film this because they had to control the traffic and yeah and it's the the it's an action scene that's really amazing but it isn't short what makes it work you know a lot of the action scenes in this are not short they go on for at least a little bit too long and though the freeway chase isn't short you know the there are a lot of different types of action in it it's a very dynamic scene it keeps focus on the the human characters and it uses a lot of separate elements to you know that really come together and i'm not saying at all that the rest of the action scenes in this could have done all of that I'm saying the rest of them should have been shorter. And, you know, the, the way they were in the first one. In the first one, no action scene by itself went on for too long. There was always a little bit of breathing room between action scenes, and it never got truly repetitive. And one one action scene that I really love is the chateau fight with you know all this marble and all these statues all this gorgeous art and it all just it's it all gets destroyed over the course of the fight as neo and these exiles fight with you know these traditional weapons some of them asian and yeah and i i do love every single short action scene in this and to an extent the you know some of them are more obviously choreographed here i don't i can understand why that why some would be bothered by that but i'm honestly not too bothered by it and you know this this was made when effects visual effects got so good that we could do almost anything you know like big hollywood movies can do almost anything they want with visual effects today you know, still and yeah around 2002-2003 you know attack of the clones also suffers from this when you can do just anything then yeah why hold back and yeah so they you know action scenes get bigger or do certain things that we couldn't have that they couldn't have before and yeah they forgot that you shouldn't just keep you know adding on top over and over and you know one thing i will say is that 
a lot of like effects that really like are in love with the fact that they can get to be as big as you know they end up the the camera work surrounding them end up being somewhat plain and in this the camera does dance around the way it did in the first so it does still have that going for it As others have noted, the because of all the effects, a lot of the action ends up feeling artificial and sanitized. It doesn't feel like you you can't really like feel the individual blows. You you don't Yeah, you, you can't really relate to it. It feels a little too neat. And that is something where in, in the first you could really feel and yeah. And at times, the effects can be really obvious. And animated faces in this vary, and some are absolutely terrible. And I, I guess they just hadn't thought of it at the time. Maybe it would have been really, really difficult. But that is the the kind of you know, there's some truly terrible face animation in you know Terminator Three as well. I. I don't know for sure, but I, I feel like today it probably is that they try to actually film someone, you know, they try to just more or less film someone's face in the, the situation where it's going to be really close up. And then, you know, part of it here is also that there are so many faces in some of these scenes that it would be difficult if you know if they had to film every single one of them rather than animate but yeah and certainly there are a ton of effects in this but I would say it's still tremendously enjoyable and you know just watch the, the documentaries they did it practically whenever they could you know it was more, you know, they, they used the effects to close the gaps between the practical and how they wanted to end up looking, you know, also removing wires and, you know, making it so that they could film the, the scene in a safe way, making it more cost effective and, and such. And some say that, well, really, some of the action scenes don't really have that such, you know, particularly strong reasons behind. They, they don't feel like this action scene needed to exist. And that is a problem. That's, you know, and personally, because I enjoy them so much, I don't mind it as much, but I'm not going to pretend like that's not a problem. The, yeah, a, an action scene should not exist purely for its own sake. You know, the a lot of them, they don't really change the status quo. They don't, they're not necessarily that connected to the scenes surrounding them. And, the you know, one thing that can make an action scene really feel like it has, you know weight to it that has consequences is if a MacGuffin changes hands and yeah a lot of the time that doesn't really happen here it's just it's it's characters who can fight do fight you know and, and there are times where like you know maybe someone is fighting because this just you know they 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 have to buy someone else time or maybe it's just they you know, they, they have to fight the other person because the other person is going to fight them and they just, you know. But, yeah, at the end of the day, the thing is, if you can remove it and it doesn't affect that much, then what you have should probably be removed or you should find a reason for it to be there. And, yeah, like I said, they didn't kill their darlings. And some uh, some conversations don't really change the status quo either. And 
to, you know, some of the action scenes do show that, okay, this character can actually fight or will actually fight in, in this circumstance, or maybe it shows how powerful the character is or the like. And it is true that now that Neo is the one, there's not that much tension to his fights. But there's still so much fun, though, to, to me. Again, I can completely understand if you... Yeah, if, if, you, if you're not hooked on Keanu Reeves playing Neo fighting, you know, with, with, excuse me, with these superpowers, basically... Yeah, it's, you know, he's not scared, he's showing that he's not scared, and the audience doesn't really feel worried, that there's there's no real tension, there's, yeah, there, there isn't really any tension, and, yeah, the, the, it only really exists for the, the badassery of it. And the, you know, the scenes will either build momentum or absolutely kill it. And there are these long portions where it's either just action, just philosophy, just exposition. The first, third, and the last, fourth or sixth, especially just, yeah, just largely exposition, and these are vital parts of your story. This is where, respectively, you're grabbing your audience and leaving us wanting more, which, since the movie doesn't end, we are left wanting more, but, yeah, it's, it's, these are some of the most important parts of your, your story, and, yeah, they're, they're not that impressive here. And there are some really goofy parts, like the fact that Neo can fly is genuinely, they, they refer to it, you know, Michael Dawson says he's doing his Superman thing, you know, so, yeah, it, it is just, they, they, they come right out and say it, but then they're also, the, the critics point out the music in some of this, you know, is genuinely Superman-like music, and it kind of pulls you out of it. This really doesn't balance or pace well the action, philosophical, and philosophy and exposition the when when they talk philosophy you know the 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 lines themselves even entire monologues they just they go on for too long they're not necessarily really going anywhere specific they don't they don't necessarily feel that vital to you know and maybe half of the philosophy is spouted by the villains, but it's not the kind of typical, you know, when, when your villain in your Hollywood action movie, which at the end of the day, this is still a Hollywood action movie, it's not an independent film, it is a Hollywood action movie, you know, paid for and advertised as a Hollywood action movie, in that, when the villain speaks directly to the heroes, we expect it to be like he's insulting them, he's talking about how much better he is, he's revealing his nefarious plan, something. But no, here they're just, they're explaining their worldview or the like. It's very abstract and ponderous, and yeah, it just... It's, it, it very much tells rather than shows. And yeah, they, they talk fate, destiny, reality. And some of these scenes, especially if, you know, if it's like a villain or a bad guy character who can fight or who has someone that will fight, we expect 
there to be an action scene. We're just waiting for them to stop talking and start punching each other. And it's just, it's so strange. I don't, I can't think of any other action movie that we're, we're just so decidedly the characters will talk instead of fighting and talk about things like that. Like when we meet the Merovingian, yeah, he he just sits there for a while and just talks, just explains how he views the world. And that's that helps explore his character and you know, the it's it's reasonably an interesting, engaging philosophy, but it's not what we want from this is the the good guys are confronting some of the bad guys. We don't want them to just talk especially when they're not really talk like some of it they actually do get get down to saying okay you know this is this is what you want but this is what I'm going to do or something but so much of it doesn't feel like it connects to that doesn't feel like it's going there and though the movie has plenty of both style and substance, it's just, yeah, the, there's, you know, one of them will take over the movie for a while and then finally relinquish control to the other. It is very much a case of egos going unchecked and yes men reverberating through the echo chamber and the movie came out basically how the Wachowskis wanted it to more than what would necessarily be the best yeah the opening of this is ridiculously operatic and it's just it's it's one of the rare cases where i actually agree with cinema sins that and you know a, a series of logos or the like take too long and in this case it's not the logos but it's this code rain you know the which yes that was what we we expected to see code rain when we went in to see the second matrix movie for sure but we did not expect nor need to see anywhere near as much of it it basically it gradually constructs an entire clock as the the camera dances around it and after it's constructed this clock it gradually the camera pulls out and then there's this obvious fade directly from the code rain to the actual clock and it's just it immediately kills the illusion the and this bothered me the very first time this bothered me on every viewing since I cannot believe that they couldn't tell they do something very similar in the first one, but in the first one, in the, the very opening of the first one, in both cases, it's not, you know, opening titles, it's just the title of the movie that comes up, and then, and what it is, is just this, in, in the first one, what it goes directly to is the f is is we're staring right down a flash you know ran into a flashlight f um, of one of the cops and for that it has this if it had cut to just the side of the flashlight being white then that wouldn't have worked but it's because it goes from you know when you see the code rain and you you're only seeing code rain we know that that's computer generated obviously but when you then go from this kind of green well yeah in the first it's also it's not just code rain but it's it's this green kind of stuff you know it's yeah and it it goes through that and then directly into this flashlight and the the flash of the flashlight the the blinding light for for a fraction of a second hides the transition between the two. This one doesn't, and I just, I don't understand how they could 
just ignore it and just present it as though it is invisible when it so clearly isn't. I just, it, it seems like the kind of thing where maybe they realized it very late and they didn't have time to change it, but it's something that you test, you make sure, and then when your film, you know, so that, so that the opening of your film doesn't break suspension of disbelief so significantly, so immediately. As I already mentioned, the hovercrafts now have guns mounted on them, you know, machine guns that you man from the inside, which is why it would be a good idea for there to be more than one person anyway. I suppose when you're hacked into the matrix, you're not necessarily... Well, actually, yeah, even in that case, you might want to fight off at least some of the... It would still be good to have some extra hands on manning the guns. So, anyway, please ignore that in the first one they specifically said EMP is the only weapon we have against them. You know, they didn't say the on that this ship only has EMP or anything, you know, and it's apparently only been six months since the end of the first one. All other ships have them, including the Logos, which, again, has only three people. Yeah. They even mention in the game, but it's not a spoiler, that it's rare that all the ships are back. So, are you telling me that individually, whenever a ship came back in the six months, the first time a ship, one of those ships came back in the six months, so, you know, whenever during the six months they first came up with the idea of putting machine guns on hovercrafts, that just then, you know, everybody who could, you know, just went in, everyone who was great at you know assembling these things went in and put the machine guns on you know plugged them into the you know people can sit inside the hovercraft and guide these machine guns you know it's it they're not like automatic you don't just have to no, no, no you you you're not just mounting a machine gun on top of a hovercraft you're putting all this wiring and making sure that you can aim it fire it you know, from the inside, it just, yeah, it's just, it's, again, they should either have just had the, the, I don't know, maybe, maybe if in the first one they had guns, but they just said, we don't currently have, you know, if they had said, we don't currently have any ammunition, and you didn't see them fired in the whole movie, then we might, you know, then they might be Je Chekhov's guns, but yeah, again, it's just, it's a big problem. It's, yeah. Zion is guarded by mechs, because aliens and these mechs carry, you know, they, they dual wield automatic rifles, because John Woo. This is remarkably campy in parts. As Rod Hilton of the editing room points out in his abridged script for the movie, there are a lot of non-noir settings in this for how neo-noir both this and the first movie are. And the first movie does not have very many non-noir settings. This has a lot of passion and sexuality and... I don't, at the end of the day, I, you know, a lot of it ends up just kind of awkward and uncomfortable, and some have suggested that this is because, you know, we are so, you know, we're, we're prudish and, like, overly, you know, there's there's anxiety whenever sexuality comes up in, you know, in our Western Christian, you know, not, not only Christian, but 
Christian culture, even when not, you know, I suppose that it might be worse for some because of that, but personally, I don't really have any problem. One of my all-time favorite movies is The Piano Teacher. You know, the, it's it's hard to get much more, like, overtly sexual, not necessarily sexy, but sexual than that movie, and it's, you know, the, it's, it's also one of the most, you know, a, a movie that goes into the sex, you know, sex and sexuality, goes into things that are very off-putting to, you know, and, and it's intentionally, it's not, it's not a movie that's supposed to be sexy, it's a movie that confronts some very uh, yeah, uncomfortable aspects about it, and I love that movie, so personally, it's not that, I just yeah, I I think part of it is also that we really didn't expect it. You know, the, the first movie isn't very sexual at all. The, the really the only element is the the woman in the red dress. That's that's more or less it. You know, the yeah, there's there's the brief bit you know, there's brief bit in the rave, there's you know, obviously what Trinity is wearing. You know, it's it's not without sexuality at all, but here it just it gets so much more overt and more time is spent on it and and such. And we did not need to see Neo and Trinity have sex. And that you know I do I do respect that this does things that are very atypical for blockbusters. That's, you know, even when something like that doesn't work out, you know, they they just made the, they just proved that even a blockbuster can do that. So, you know, it it opens, it opens it up for for other people down the line to do other interesting different things with it and that's yeah so that that I really appreciate but I do still think that it it does overall hurt the movie and honestly if 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 the movie didn't have many other problems I don't think I would be as bothered by that I you know and I, I do definitely it's it's always something that you know like, no matter what they do down the line, the Wachowskis will always be remembered as the people who did The Matrix. And by doing a lot of things in this and revolutions that people didn't expect, they were gambling with the their entire reputation down the, you know, and, and this is what, this is what they do now. You know, they they haven't constant they they're not you know they they don't like have one out every other year but they've been working in the film medium since yeah second since bound but you know they they've been either directly making their own movies you know technically they wrote assassins also but since bound they've been either directing or directing by proxy you know, this is what they do now. They're 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 not gonna go back to quote unquote just they're they're not gonna go back to doing comics and not film at all. So they they took a huge risk and it, it really is impressive that their career survived this and revolutions and speed racer.
The movie is 2 hours and 10 minutes, not counting the end credits, and 2 hours and 18 minutes counting them. I've reviewed other parts of this franchise. The links are in the description box.